Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the boy and I will go over there, we will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together, and when they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. Then he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. The angel said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, or as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies. And by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves because you have obeyed my voice. Let us pray together. Creator God, in these moments ahead, may our hearts and our minds and our lives be open to receiving your word for us this day. Amen. I'm wondering how many of you are hearing this story for the very first time today. Or how many of you are hearing this story for the first time in a long time. And I'm wondering, what are you thinking about this story from Scripture? I want to be honest, right up front, I have huge problems with this text. I find it very troubling. Um, I sometimes get angry even when I read this text or when I read other people's interpretations or um, essays about this text where they try to sugarcoat it or obfuscate or get around the violence that's inherent within this text, the image of God that is within this text. I want you to wonder today, how would you react... This was a question we talked about in Sunday school this morning. How would you react if this story were happening today? If you just heard this story on the news, what would you think of this father willing to sacrifice his only son? Or imagine that story that's in the news all over the place right now of the father who may have intentionally left his son in a hot car on a summer's day. What if it turned out that that father says, well, and he believed it sincerely, God told me to do it that change your opinion of that story at all? Would you think it's any less horrific? Would it excuse the behavior of that father for you? For anyone in this sanctuary this morning who has ever cared for a child, can you imagine yourself in the place of Abraham, being asked to do such a thing to your only child and not asking one question, raising one argument, not offering any kind of rebuttal to God at all, not pleading for the life of your child, but simply doing what you were asked. This is a really troubling passage of Scripture. It begins way back with the story of Abraham and Sarah being promised by God that they're going to be given offspring that will be a blessing to nations for years and years to come, that their family will grow and grow, and they will be a blessing to others. Now, Abraham and Sarah, some of you remember, are very old people, and they think this is ridiculous. This couldn't happen to them. They're not going to have a child. But they trust God. They trust God so much at the beginning of the story that they uproot themselves from where they live, and they're willing to go travel to a brand new land for whatever God has ahead of them. And along the way, there are some bumps in this plan that God has. Abraham and Sarah, they doubt. They question God regularly in the story. They 
Sometimes they do things that gets in the way of what God's trying to do, but it all works out. God's promise to provide them with offspring works out, and eventually they have this son, Isaac. And if that were the end of the story, we could put a neat bow on it, and it would be a great story to tell, but it's not the end of the story. Because today's story begins with, and after all these things, God calls to Abraham and says, I need you to take your son up on top of Mount Moriah and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice to me. And without a single question, without offering any doubts at all, without trying to get in the way of God's plan like it happened in the story before this, Abraham just takes him, takes some servants, takes a pile of wood, and off they head on this three-day trip to Mount Moriah. And they get up to the top of the hill, and he takes his son off, and he places him on top of this altar, and he's just about to use that knife. And only then does a messenger of God, the angel, stay his hand and tell him, no, you don't have to do this, Abraham. What are we to make of this text? For me personally, this is a text that just cries out for us. It wants us to argue with it. It wants us to confront it. It wants us to ask questions of it, as interpreters have done since the beginning of this story. Ancient interpreters have struggled with the story to figure out what, where's the good news in this? What could it possibly mean? Some of them have even rewritten the story. There are ancient interpreters of the text that rewrote the story to say that, well, Isaac was a, an adult. So he was making his own decision to be a burnt offering. Other versions of the story actually rewrote the ending so that Abraham goes through with it. He kills Isaac. And there are hints of that even in our scripture because if you read the rest of Genesis, after this story, Isaac is never mentioned again. He disappears from the story. The most common interpretation of this text says that, well, what we really have here is a folktale that's reading back into history to try to explain how the ancient people, including the Israelites, came to switch from sacrificing children to their gods to sacrificing animals to their gods. And even if that explains it all, we still have this text in front of us. We still have this text that has this image of God as a divine manipulator. Imagine if you had a friend who tried to manipulate you like this. How would you feel about that person? What do we do with that image of God in the text? What are we to do with this father who raises no objections to his son being killed? Where's the mother who's suddenly absent in the story? Well, there are a lot of ways to interpret this text. And I'm going to share just one way with you today that has at least helped me hold on to this text to say maybe we can still work with it. It doesn't need to be tossed away. Maybe there is something to be found in this text that's useful to us. And that's what I wonder about Abraham in this text. We often say this text is about God testing Abraham, but I just wonder if Abraham isn't testing God. That Abraham isn't seeing if God will really go through with this plan. I sense in this text that Abraham, and we can only guess at this because we don't know what's going on in anybody's head in the text, that Abraham believes that this God he's been in relationship through the whole story, this God who has kept his promises, this God who he believes cares about them, is not going to let this happen. And there's some clues in the text that suggest that. Abraham says to the two servants that they have with him, my son and I, we're going to go over here, we're going to worship for a while, and then we, he says, we will come back. And when the boy asks Abraham, um, Father, where's the lamb that we're going to use for this sacrifice? Abraham says to the boy, God will provide. Now, unless we can imagine a, God, a father in that situation making a joke at the expense of his son, we might assume that Abraham is thinking, yes, God will provide some way out of this story, out of this horrible thing that's about to happen. And I have to wonder, had the story ended up differently, if the text had ended up where the boy had died, if this might have been the end of Abraham's relationship with this God. That Abraham would have said, this is not a God I can follow. A God that would ask this of me or of any person is not the kind of God I can follow. And I wonder if that's a question we can ask ourselves today. What kind of God do we follow? 
What kind of God do we worship? Is it the kind of God that would ask of a father to sacrifice a child for some greater good or to make some point or a message? Do we follow a God that would put the weight of a child's destruction on his or her own back to carry? What kind of God do we follow? Do we follow any of the many gods that are in our culture, in our world today, that still ask us to sacrifice our children? They're out there. They're around us all the time. Those gods are everywhere. Maybe you heard about this uh, photographic exhibit that was hugely controversial recently. This Cuban uh, young man, he's a photographer, he's also a Christian, created this photographic exhibit and it's, a, it's photos of children that appear to be posed like Jesus crucified on the cross. But they're not crucified on a crucifix. They're crucified on the backs of adults who are standing like this in the photo. So you can imagine the children are hanging off of these adults crucified. One of the photos is of um, a girl who's t Taiwanese who's supposed to uh, represent a child caught in sex trafficking. And she is crucified on the back of a Western tourist. One of the images is of an overweight boy who is hanging off the back of, crucified on the back of Ronald McDonald. One of the images is of a girl um, caught in violence who is hanging off the back of an inner city gang member. And probably the most controversial image, the one that caused his page to be taken down off of Facebook when he put this photo up, is of a scantily clad boy hanging off the back of a Catholic cardinal priest. And it's unclear when you look at these photos, are we supposed to assume that the adults in the photos represent the perpetrators of violence against these children, or are they supposed to represent those of us who have turned our backs on the sacrifice of children within our culture? Both that photographic exhibit and this text before us today ask us to wonder what kind of God do we follow? Do we follow the gods of our culture, the god of economics, the god of commerce, who would be willing to let us sacrifice our children, our children's health, for the sake of having cheap hamburgers and fries and sugary sodas to drink? Are we willing to sacrifice our children to the god of tradition that says the rights of abusive parents are more important than the rights of the children that they abuse? Are we willing to sacrifice our children onto the altar of poverty that keeps them caught in a cycle of economic instability and inadequate education? Are we willing to sacrifice our children on the altar of violence and war that says we're willing to let our children be child soldiers or be collateral damage in the sake of national honor and victory? What kind of God do we follow? What kind of God do we worship? I think it's a poignant question to ask on this weekend in particular, this 4th of July weekend, when God is being invoked all over our country these days. We're singing God bless America, and we're using our money that is emblazoned with the phrase, in God we trust, and we talk about being one nation under God, but somebody is always conspicuously absent from those civil, religion, national invocations of God, there's one name that we almost never say when we talk about that God. It's the name of a child who himself was sacrificed to appease the gods of his culture. And that's Jesus. In fact, if you look at the patriotic hymns in our own hymnal, none of them mention Jesus. But how can we have a conversation as, about God? How can we as Christians have a dialogue about God and never talk about Jesus? Because Jesus is the lens through which we understand God, where God ceases to be something up there or out there or something intangible and becomes a life lived, a life that can be followed. It is the God of Jesus that tells us that we have to say no to violence against the most vulnerable amongst us. It's the God of Jesus that says we have to say no to the economic deprivation of the most vulnerable amongst us. It's the God of Jesus who says there's a different way to be in the world. I think it's the God of Jesus that would argue against this text today to say that image that they had so long ago of who I am 
That wasn't the right image. For them at the time, it's how they understood it. But now you know better. You know that you find me in the life of Jesus, in the love of Jesus, in the justice of Jesus, in the grace of Jesus, a life that would never, never let the vulnerable be sacrificed on the altar of the idols of this world. Many people have looked at this story and said, ah, see how many parallels there are between this story and the story of Jesus about a father sacrificing his son. They look for Jesus in this ancient story. But I want to suggest to you, as my final thought for you, that we don't find Jesus in the story in the character of Isaac. We don't find Jesus in the story in the character of Abraham. I don't even think we find Jesus in this story in the character of God. We find Jesus in this story in the angel, in the one who reaches out a hand, stays that blade, that violent act, and says, no more. This is not the way it will be. This is not how we're called to be in the world. Let us pray. God, we're so thankful today for the stories of our faith that challenge us, that push us to think more deeply about who you are. Help us to be the ones that reach out the hand, that stay the blade, that work to end violence, that speak out for the vulnerable. In Christ's name we pray.